Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for uh, pardon for June twenty uh, second, twenty twenty. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is how worried should I be? The worst question we keep asking about research cybersecurity with Susan Sons. Susan is the Deputy Director of Research SOC and the Chief Security Analyst uh, at Indiana University's Center of Applied Cybersecurity Research. Before we begin, I have a few things to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Uh, second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. I'll be monitoring that so I can um, ask questions uh, while Susan is presenting. So go ahead and click the chat uh, icon to pull up the window and type in your question there. And we also are planning on taking questions at the end of the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Susan. Susan, welcome. Hi, thank you, Jeanette. I'm going to jump into some slides here. Can everybody see that all right? Yep, I can see it. Excellent. So I ended up titling this, How Worried Should I Be? Because that is a question that I am asked a lot. When we talk about threat intelligence, um, people say, well, how worried should I be? And the answer is always, don't be worried. And the answer is like that when things are fine and when things are terrible because Sorry, I had you guys know us. I'll get back to this in a minute. But when we worry, there are plenty of things to worry about. But what we get is we get stressed out. We spread our resources between stress and between the things we can actually do to improve our security. And we struggle with stakeholder management because they get a lot of worry, but they don't feel secure that we have a strategy. Um, and worrying doesn't actually make things more secure. So a quick introduction for those of you not familiar with Research SOC. Um, Research SOC is a, an NSF funded collaboration that provides operational cybersecurity services for NSF organizations that need help with things like monitoring, threat intelligence, and um, understanding the things that they see on their network in real time so that we can provide that 24-7 monitoring and just let your staff know when there's something you need to act on. Um, it's a really great service that's spread across a number of institutions, as you can see here. Um, the core services are network monitoring, vulnerability scanning, a series of honeypots that feed back into our intelligence and monitoring network, as well as a team of project liaisons and incident response coordinators for incidents that affect more than one NSF facility. Um, we're also now starting to offer virtual security teams for those organizations that are having trouble building out a full security team internally. They can get a partial or full security team from us. More information is coming on that soon. Um, but this is an idea of some of the things that we do and where my talk is coming from. Um, so back to why do we worry and what do we get for it? So you saw this slide a moment ago, and there are a lot of unknowns and things we can't control. And there's an idea out there that cybersecurity is an infinite mandate. In other words, every time we reach the goalposts, the goalposts are going to move and we won't be done. Um, and that causes people to worry. And this idea that if we're worrying we're on top of things is one of the big false flags that causes a lot of stress in our industry. I read an article a while back that said something like 20 or 25% of CISOs go on psychiatric medication or become alcoholics after taking the job. That's terrible. <laughs> um, and this is not a mental health talk, but this is a talk about um, using threat intelligence in a way that isn't about how much do I worry, it's about what actions can I take and moving on with those actions. So here's how I've broken it down. You're going to get the world's smallest threat briefing. It is literally two slides. Um, and then we're gonna talk about a different approach to threat awareness that is not primarily focused on naming the threat actors. 
And then we're going to talk about three ways that you can move closer to zero worry cybersecurity starting today, because I wanted you to walk away with something that you can do. And in case you didn't believe Jeanette when she said it, or in case you didn't hear her say it, I love being interrupted with questions. Um, much to the terror of my mother, who's a very well-ordered elementary school teacher, I love being interrupted because it tells me that people are interested in what I'm saying. They have a question, they have a comment, so feel free to raise your hand or throw a question out in chat, and we'll break the conversation to talk about what you guys really care about. So here we go, the mini threat briefing. Um, before you get the, the two slides of the mini threat briefing, these are the places that ResearchSoc gets our threat data. Um, we're correlating data from multiple threat intelligence services, so we get data from a couple of certs. We get data from Ren ISAC. We get data from other threat intelligence services. We're putting this stuff together, looking for patterns and looking for things that do and do not look like they fit the profile of research cybersecurity needs because not everything we see makes sense for research. For example, there are some things that really are only going to make sense if you are a shipping company and we're not a shipping company. Um, the research fleet has ships, but that's not the same thing as being a shipping company. Um, there are threats that only really make sense if you are running a particular esoteric operating system that we don't have in our community. Um, things like that. We start to look at how to how does all this data go together and what can we throw out because it's not relevant to our use cases? Um, we get network monitoring data from the research SOC clients. And we also have Stinger Honeypot data from the Stinger network. For those of you who are not familiar with honeypots, this is a kind of fun thing where you put out a computer that is not part of your operations. It is meant to be attacked. It is attractive looking to attackers, but what it's doing is it's sending telemetry back to the people who protect your networks. So if someone connects to that box because the box doesn't have a real job, you know they're an attacker. And now you know, first of all, that there's an attacker in your network. Second, you know what kind of things they're looking for and exploiting. And Third, you can get an idea of what they're doing and you can decide whether to move in right away and shut them down or to let them play with the honeypot a little while and gather data on them. Um, these are our primary ways that we get data. Um, and this is where my very, very tiny mini threat briefing is coming from. And in a minute, when I get into how I want you to start thinking about threat briefings, you'll understand why I made this so tiny to start out with. Okay, so slide number one, the top three points of entry. The places where the bad guys get into your stuff. Compromised credentials, old unpatched vulnerabilities, and misconfiguration. Um, I wish, I wish that this were new and exciting information, but it is the same song that cybersecurity has been singing to you for a decade or more. Because so much of our world has not changed their behavior yet, um, we're seeing these things over and over. Some of these are getting better, but none of them are good enough that the majority of attackers have had to move to more sophisticated methods of entry because there's enough of the easy stuff here. Why would I climb in a window when I can walk in through the door? It's kind of the same idea. We've all seen these before and so have all the attackers and they keep appearing. Um, so slide number two of the world's shortest threat briefing. These are the top three escalation aids. So great, somebody got in. Getting in isn't the whole case here. So where, what helps people who've gotten into your network or gotten into a system get into something bigger? How do they find the crown jewels? The big, big one is long lifetimes. Um, we're not seeing enough comprehensive monitoring and detection. So attackers get to wander around, take their time, leave a callback script, monitor your stuff. Um, they get to take a lot of time to plan how a small entry point, a foothold, is going to turn into a wider attack and give themselves ways back in if you destroy that foothold. Um, the fact that so many attacks don't get detected for months and months gives them an incredibly long time to do internal reconnaissance on your network. Um, number two is broken architecture. Um, this is really basic stuff. Failures of compartmentation, minimization, and fault tolerance. Um, those of you who are familiar with the information security practice principles, um, 
these are three of the seven principles that I consider the architecture principles, but we see it frequently. We see a lack of fault tolerance. We see organizations that have sort of put a secure border around their organization, but they have no protection inside for stuff that's penetrated the border. Um, we also see organizations that haven't separated less secure or less critical systems from more critical systems. So people break into the easy stuff and then they can move to the more sensitive stuff. Um, we see organizations that have a lot of connection methods, a lot of credentials, and a lot of systems and stuff they just don't need. So they have these huge, huge attack services that are very difficult to protect where if they'd planned the architecture better to tighten it up, they'd have had a lot less to protect. Um, and the other one is poor credential management. We still see this sloppy stuff with all the admins having one password, no multi-factor, no key-based auth. Um, and once somebody gets in and they're your admin, as far as your network knows, they're your admin. The network can't look at a guy and say, oh, well, he has the password, but that really doesn't look like Joe. Hey, Susan, so, we've got a question real quick. Go Sorry. For it. Uh, going back to point one, what is a callback script? Is that a backdoor? So, sort of. A callback script is a trick because m lots of people who have rudimentary monitoring monitor incoming connections but do not monitor outgoing connections. So a smart attacker will make an incoming connection when they have to make that first attack, but it will be brief and you won't notice it because they'll leave a script that will then make outgoing connections to a machine that they control. And then they never have to make an incoming connection to your network again. Um, it's a way to mask traffic because um, while something like ResearchSock is very comprehensive and can monitor incoming and outgoing traffic, um, a lot of organizations that are less mature will only man will only monitor incoming traffic. So once you have that callback script in place, your connections are invisible. Um, and it's sad because we know how to fix it. We just don't always fix it. Great, thank you. So I have a feeling that a lot of people on this call would really like to worry less. I don't like worrying. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, we might have some Olympic champion worriers out there who are really into it. I'm not a big worrier, or at least I try not to be because worrying sucks. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about an approach to th threat awareness. This is a series of tiny mental models that I use to handle the threat intelligence that's coming into my life and my world and my work without worrying about it. Because whenever you want to ask me how worried should I be, the answer is zero. Zero worrying, because worrying will not make your security better under any circumstance. As a matter of fact, um, I, I was a Latin nerd in high school and I became a fan of the Stoics, um, mostly because their stuff was easy and fun to translate compared to many other things. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about identifying and separating those things that you can't control versus those things you can control. Um, and this is not a new idea. I'm not at all confident that Ep Epictetus was the first one to have it, um, but he wrote it down in discourses and has been quoted several centuries, actually a couple millennia later. He's doing pretty good. We've got a question here. Go for it. Uh, how much detection of threats is due to few evidences versus many evidences pulled together. Is the accuracy and comprehensiveness a reason for long delay to report incidents? I'm trying to understand whether accuracy and comprehensiveness are part of the sources of worry. Okay, so I think it's a little of both. And I'm going to, so one of the problems with accuracy is a lot of organizations don't know what their traffic or their configuration should look like. So they're, even when their monitoring is fairly comprehensive, it's easy to blow a lot of things off because you're not sure how wrong they look. Um, and the lack of comprehensiveness is a really big thing that I'm seeing in research. Um, there are a lot of organizations who have no centralized logging. There are a lot of organizations that have no comprehensive network monitoring. 
Um, there are a lot of organizations that don't have a central repository of what their machine configurations are supposed to look like and don't have change control. So what happens is if I'm coming in, let's say that I'm your internal incident responder and somebody said, hey, I saw a weird blip from this machine. I can't tell if it's an attack or not. I can't look at that machine and tell if it's configured the way we left it. And so what can we do but wait and see? And that leads to this longevity of an attack and giving an attacker a long time to work. The more accurate information you have about your assets and the more comprehensive your monitoring of those assets, the more you have an early warning system and you can do things before that longevity piece comes to play in favor of your attacker. Does that help answer the question? I don't see a reply yet, so let's continue and we can double back to it later. Okay, so this is my number one threat intel filter. The only facts that matter are the facts that lead to actions which improve my organization's security and support our mission. In other words, if I see a fact and I cannot use it to guide action, it is not a fact that can help me. It's gonna go in some kind of cold storage bin until such point that I can use that fact to guide an action, which might be never. Um, if I can't act on it, it's either going to cause worry or do nothing. And I prefer it to do nothing because worry has costs, but no benefits. So think about that. How many facts do you keep in your head that are causing worry but not actually guiding action? They're not helping you make your security better. Getting disciplined about throwing those facts out actually makes you better at security. And that's counterintuitive because we talk a lot about getting as many facts and as much intelligence as we can, but there's such a thing as having too many pieces of information in your head. It becomes a cacophony and we don't focus. So this is my rule. If it cannot lead to an action which will improve my organization's security or support our mission, it's not a fact that I need and it goes, it'll get logged somewhere. I can look it up later, but it's not allowed in my brain. It cannot occupy space. Um, so ask yourself over and over, how can I act on this information? If the answer is I can't, throw it out. So when it comes to cybersecurity threat intelligence, these are the primary uses of it. Fine tuning detection systems, helping in discussions with stakeholders so that they can better understand risks, informing your escalation procedures. If I see something that might be an attack, but it looks exactly like what three other similar facilities have seen in attacks, I'm going to raise the red flag a lot faster than if I see something that eh, might maybe be an attack, but there's no other sign of attack and nobody has seen a a pattern that resembles this. Um, we can use it to make our escalation procedures smarter. Choosing controls beyond the baseline. I'm going to emphasize beyond the baseline here because if you don't have your baseline controls in place and you're not rigorously enforcing them, threat intelligence will not help you with controls because all your threat intelligence will tell you is go fix your baseline controls first. Um, active defense. These are things like um, very few organizations have the budget to do this. I'm yet to see an NSF center that can do this, but it's when you have the guy who is in your SOC, but is also has control of your internal infrastructure and he's going, oh shoot, we're getting a DDoS. I'm going to change our incoming network rules from this ISP to this other ISP that we use and I'm gonna reroute traffic and I'm gonna change all our load balancers and I'm gonna do this and this. Um, it's when you have somebody hands on keys, eyes on glass, who is responding in real time. Um, and it's extremely expensive because you can't just have people ready to alert the folks in charge. You have to have someone you trust with control of your network, eyes on glass, hands on keyboard 24 seven. This is not normal except in a very few organizations. Um, some military and government stuff, um, a few really big companies like CDNs and big media providers, um, a couple big ISPs, but it is very, very rare in the rest of the world. And finally, attribution. And attribution is not surmising who did something, but gathering enough evidence that you can prove it. 
Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about when active defense are and are not and attribution are and are not useful. So most threat briefings come in one of two forms. They often look like this. Don't read too much into the icons. I just picked random ones that I thought were funny. Um, but they will pick five plus or minus two actors to tell you about. They will usually give them logos and then vaguely describe them and their motivations and behaviors. Or they'll give you the pyramid of who do we think is the most scary at the top, who do we think is the least scary at the bottom, and then we will act like it's an exact ladder up to the top of having more capabilities and resources, um, even though it can be very variable between groups. And it's very, very focused only on who are the threat actors. And this can be useful information when your information security program reaches a certain level of maturity and resources and integration into your organization. But for most of us, especially in open research, we're just not there yet. So let's talk about what this type of threat briefing is good for. Actor intelligence helps us with those last two items only. It helps us with active defense and attribution. Um, it doesn't help us do anything better with our detection systems. Doesn't help us a whole lot with our stakeholders other than freaking them out occasionally if we got a really good scary story from an authority figure. Um, doesn't really change our escalation procedures or suggest new controls. What it does is help us understand their psychology if we're trying to fight them in real time and helps us attribute an attack to the correct actor. If you do not have the resources for active defense and attribution, if these are not your priorities, I'm going to advise you not to spend a bunch of time, energy, and room in your head on actor intelligence. It changes frequently. It is inaccurate often enough to be confusing if you're not accustomed to dealing with this kind of intelligence on a regular basis. And it's only useful for those two activities that I'm not sure your organization is engaging in. So before you spend a lot of time and energy on actor intelligence, you need to have a serious think about, are you going to engage in active defense? Are you going to engage in attribution? And if so, how big of a part of your cybersecurity are those activities compared to the others on my list? So let's talk about threat method intelligence. The mini briefing that I gave you in two slides was threat methods. I talked about how do people get in, and I talked about how do they escalate an attack. That was a very simplistic briefing. I gave you the top three of each that I'm seeing in the research community right now, but it's good for everything on this list. When you know the methods people use to get in, you can work on your filters and your alerts and get better at detecting those methods. It can help you focus discussions with stakeholders because it gives you an idea of what things are we trying to block and what controls do we really want to invest in. It can help you inform escalation procedures because the more you understand about how the bad guys behave, the more you know whether you've detected those behaviors. And when it comes to choosing controls beyond the baseline, the more you understand the methods of bad actors, the more you understand the value in different controls of disrupting those methods. It also helps you in active defense. If you wanna disrupt somebody, you better know how they operate. And it can help you with attribution if you get to that point because different threat actors tend to prefer slightly different methodology when you get to the high end of behavior after all the low hanging fruit is gone. So method intelligence is great for everything and it's very easy to use because the amount that it changes tends to be very low at the soft target end and very high at the hard target end. In other words, if you're still working on the basics in your cybersecurity program, the stuff you need to know about bad guy methods changes very rarely. When you have a very mature and active cybersecurity program that's doing top of the line everything, that's when that this threat intelligence is going to evolve more quickly. But at that point, you have the resources and the rigor and the knowledge and discipline to deal with those changes. It sort of scales with where you are in the maturity ladder. It's one of the reasons that I like to encourage people to use this kind of intelligence a lot. The third kind of intelligence that I think about in my head is target intelligence. In other words, understanding the values and motivations that lead someone to target my organization and my assets. I'm gonna talk about this one a little more at length 
because I think that our community hears about it less and I want you to understand this mental model and how to use it to your advantage. Target intelligence is the ultimate home court advantage. And the reason it is, is when I say target, I mean your assets. I mean the thing the bad guy is targeting. And who should know your assets better than you? Nobody. Um, we all struggle with discovering our own assets, but the more that we do, we get this intelligence. You don't have to go out in the world and hang out with bad guys. You don't have to get intelligence agencies to talk to you. You don't have to get a clearance so the FBI will be happy. This intelligence is sitting right there on your network and therefore is the most accessible intelligence to you at all times. It helps with all of these areas, just like method intelligence, and so it's a great thing to have and it can help you make your security better. So, motivations for information security breaches come down to pride, money, and security. And when I talk about security, I'm not talking about information security, I'm talking about security of a person or thing. Um, frequently national security, but not only national security. Um, these often overlap. Somebody might have more than one of these goals, but instead of figuring out who my threat actors are, I focus on how would somebody who wants money behave? How would somebody who's trying to take me down a notch or inflate their own ego behave? Those are my pride actors. How would people who are trying to compromise national security because they're a state actor or a terrorist group or something behave? Which of these people are interested in things that I have? And what things could they do to my assets to meet these goals? And this is a really interesting way to think because it gives you information on your threat actors without having to go out and research intelligence about your threat actors or know when they change. Because the threat actor landscape will always be changing rapidly. However, your assets don't change that rapidly and their value to other people don't, doesn't usually change that rapidly. So let's talk about target attractions. What attracts a target and how do you disrupt that attraction? So people who are motivated by money will only want to do something as long as it's profitable, which means you have two choices. You can make the attack more expensive for the attacker or you can reduce the size of the prize. Um, when we talk about data minimization, we're talking about reducing the size of the prize here. Um, if someone has something less valuable to steal, they're not going to spend as much money trying to steal it. People who are after your money are trying to make a profit. They're not going to spend $100 stealing 50 cents worth of information. Feel free to inflate that to an appropriate scale. So pride. They will only do these attacks while they are satisfying. And when it comes to pride, people think of random script kitties defacing things, and that is certainly a thing that happens. But there are also a lot of other pride attackers. Um, one of the thing, politically motivated attacks and hacktivists fit into the pride area. Um, another area is when we deal with um, stalkers and domestic violence. This is someone who has some emotional and identity thing going on who's trying to satisfy it. This, this is pride, this is ego. Um, first of all, they don't care if it's profitable. They will happily lose money on the affair. So what do they actually care about? Well, if they can't get as much satisfaction from what they're doing, that's a way to shake them off, but also increasing the risk that they're going to lose status, look foolish, or fail. Um, nobody who's out there for their own pride really wants to fail publicly or look stupid. Um, and they don't want to experience frustration. Um, people who are pride motivated tend not to be the best on the impulse control. Um, there are exceptions, especially when we get to hacktivist groups, because those people are less about personal pride and more about an issue or a mission or a feeling of, um, a, a feeling of being righteous. But in any case, um, disrupting pride is harder than disrupting money. So sometimes it's just having better defenses. When it comes to security, think about what security you're talking about. Often when we talk about security, what we really mean is a proxy for money or pride. For example, people talk to me about security against corporate espionage all the time. That's just a proxy for money. 
because nobody does corporate espionage when they're going to lose money because of it. They do corporate espionage when they think they can make a profit, when they think that their company can win. So that's just a proxy for money. Um, when people talk to me about security for, um, I work with survivors of domestic violence on personal cybersecurity as a side hobby. That security is a substitute for pride because the controlling ex-partner feels like they've lost control and that's an ego blow for them. So this is a pride motivation. Um, when security is not a proxy for something else, this gets very complicated because we're often in something like national security territory. I'm not gonna try to cover all of this in this talk, but the good thing about that is when you are in that territory, there are usually people who are better funded than we are who are trying to help you. So the biggest thing for security is look at who else has an interest in protecting what you're trying to protect. So, um, steps toward worry-free cybersecurity. And I promise I'm almost to the end of yammering it, you guys. I'd really like to get a lot of good questions in here. And uh, Jeanette asked me to keep it short so we can talk. Um, I want you to all work, walk away from here with things that you can do to never ask how worried I should be again. To think about how you're gonna make your security better and use the things that will help you and take all the things that you can't act on and put them in a bucket and walk, walk away. So when I say zero worry, when I say don't worry, I don't mean that I will make it perfect, nothing will ever go wrong and you don't have to accept risk and risk will not be there. It means being disciplined enough to think and act rather than worry. Understanding that worrying never makes security better and taking all the stuff you worry about and separating it into the things you can control and the things that you cannot control. And that starts with how you interpret intelligence because there's intelligence you can act on and intelligence you can only worry about. So three steps. Number one, separate that which you can and cannot control. This is something that starts with one individual in an organization. You have to be disciplined and you have to be ready to disrupt the conversation when other people go down the path of obsessing over things they cannot control. I do my best to ensure that my organizations are wasting as close as possible to zero time and resources on the intelligence we will not or cannot use. Um, when I get a threat intelligence briefing about um, how we could do research and attribution on a machine at a third party organization that we don't control, that has amateur sysadmins that's sort of vaguely connected to our network, um, what I'll tell somebody is good luck and you're welcome to contact those people directly, but we don't control the machines, we don't control the staff, and we don't believe that there is the monitoring and other tools in place to do that level of forensics. So we're not going to worry about that and put it on our plate. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure that those machines can't hurt the rest of the network that it's connected to. We're going to make sure there aren't credentials there that can run away with no one noticing as they get access to assets at other sites. Because this is open science. We don't want to kick everyone out of the club who can't get up to the highest, highest level of cybersecurity. I don't think most of us want to blow our budgets on getting to the highest possible level of cybersecurity. We want enough cybersecurity. So when we decide we're not going to do something, we need to set it aside and make it not part of the discussion or at least say we'll reevaluate this in X months or in a year instead of making it something that we're constantly wasting our brain cycles on. And this is a mental discipline that takes a long, long time to develop in an organization, but it only takes one person to start it and to ask this question every time it comes up in a conversation. So what do we plan to do about it? And if the answer is nothing, it's then let's set this aside and focus on what we can do. The next thing is really focus on getting the basics right. A hard target, in other words, something where you've got all of your basic controls in place and that is well monitored will thwart the majority of attacks and it makes the high-end attacks riskier and more expensive. You can't thwart every possible attack 
but the number of organizations I see that are really worried about getting threat actor reports from some federal agency and trying to understand individual threat actors when they still don't have an asset inventory, still don't have multi-factor authentication and haven't segregated their network is shocking to me. If you do not have the basics down, um, you're giving everybody easy attacks so it doesn't really matter who they are. Focus on your basics. And the third one is understand your assets like a bad guy. This is a difficult mental framework for good people who follow the rules and don't do bad things to get into. But if you hang out with people like me, who frankly in my younger life, um, one of the things that I did was work with not so nice people so that I could pass intelligence back to the good guys and the defenders. Um, talk with them, find out what they cared about, find out what they were doing, find out what they were passing around. Um, when you learn to think like that, you then know what has value and why you learn the methods that are used for exploit and you get a lot further than trying to address the specific actors because you need a top level of resources, a top level of maturity of your cybersecurity program and constant vigilance to really make use of intelligence on individual threat actors and what they're doing. The rest of it is all about maturing your cybersecurity program, getting in an order so you can defend from everybody because everybody takes advantage of the same low hanging fruit and the same medium hanging fruit. It's only at the top end where different threat actors behave very differently from one another. So that's it. Um, those are three things and I'm happy to take questions. Um, Jeanette, do we have any more questions to work with from here? Yep, we got another one that came in. Um, this, this one is, to the extent that a threat reported by multiple institutions gives more credibility to the given threat, what can or should be done to provide or promote collaboration on threat reporting and communication infrastructure? So the, I, I'm going to first say something that isn't the answer to your question, and then I promise I'll answer your question directly. Before we get to all of this reporting and communication infrastructure, one thing that I would love to see more of is a culture change. Because let me tell you, I've hung out with the good guys and I've hung out with the bad guys. When the bad guys discover something new, a new exploit, a weakness in software that could be turned into an exploit, a new trick, um, what happens is a couple of guys who want to look really good to somebody or make a lot of money talk about it privately and then use it once or twice. And then within 24 to 48 hours at most, it has been turned into an easily reproducible piece of software and distributed to every bad guy on the planet as an easy, easily recyclable script that you, do, that you need next to no skill to use. That's how fast they operate. Um, I have never seen the good guys share information that freely in my life. Um, we have a culture of this idea that if we keep information close hold, we will be safer. And we, sh we are on a glacial scale compared to the bad guys. Um, helping turn around people with the power to change our information sharing policies around cybersecurity, helping acculturate them to a more open way of sharing what's going on will give us a better advantage because right now we're losing the communication game because when one organization on the good guys side, whether it's in industry, in research, anywhere, finds out that they have a problem, telling the rest of the defenders about that vulnerability can take months or sometimes years. On the bad guy's side, it is 48 hours at the outside, maybe 72 if there's a lot of money to be made. We cannot compete when our time scales are that different. The bad guys have the advantage. So number one is I wanna see a culture change and it's gonna take all of us slowly chipping away at these ideas to get that culture change. Um, so collaboration and infrastructure. Um, Trusted CI and Research SOC and Ren ISAC are three entities that have worked really hard to provide venues for this sort of communication for our community. Um, each one has advantages and disadvantages. Um, Research SOC provides some information to all of the community, but some of our information is for our client network only. And um, that has been because with our client network, we're coordinating incident response among that group. 
so that they can act quickly together. And again, that culture problem to get all of the leadership and stakeholders on board, um, that had to be a closed group because if we publish all of that information publicly, we would have much less participation. Um, similarly, Ren ISAC acts as a cold, closed group, but it's for um, higher education networks and some research entities. Um, Ren ISAC has the advantage that it it's very well established and includes a lot of big groups that have big cybersecurity departments, including the Big Ten schools and a lot of other big universities. Um, the downside from my perspective is that a lot of NSF projects are not big enough to get Ren ISAC membership. They're just too small to swing that and be able to build and maintain those relationships, the fees, and the personnel commitments that are required to qualify for an ISEC membership. Um, so some of the large facilities have joined. Some of our smaller projects aren't going to find a way to do so. Um, Trusted CI has a lot of fantastic um, resources and they have a close partnership with Ren ISAC. So anything that Trusted CI or Ren ISAC learns will filter into the other eventually in a way that's actionable for the whole scientific community. I hope that helps. Thanks. Uh, we've got another question that came in here. Can research SOC incident handlers be used when an incident affects NSF open science activities, but not necessarily at a research SOC client? That's a really tough question, especially because I'm answering it on a recorded call with my boss here. Um, no, I'm just teasing you. Um, so if something is broadly affecting NSF open science activities, unless someone walks in and stops me, research SOC is going to pay attention for three reasons. One, I believe in being a good citizen and helping other defenders whenever it is in my power to do so. Two, I firmly believe that it benefits our clients if the environment in which they operate is more secure, and they're probably going to have to deal eventually with anything that's broadly affecting the NSF community. And third, I think that it's important to the relationships that help us keep getting the intelligence about threats to the community that we get. So um, there is a limit to what we can do for people who aren't our clients because we're not seeing your monitoring. We don't have an in-depth understanding of your networks, um, but we will do our best to participate and collaborate whether or not um, a broad attack is affecting our specific clients. Great, uh, thank you. I'm gonna give the attendees a little bit of time to type more questions if they have any. So I'm going to grab the screen back and just go over some things that uh, Trusted CI is working on and updates and other things. Uh, here we go. Okay. First of all, um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, please take our survey. I'm going to throw the link here in the chat so that you can click on it. Um, please take the survey. Uh, tell us what you think. And uh, we also accept the survey for suggestions of topics or other presenters that you would like to hear about. So we like that feedback. So please, uh, please let us know what you think. Um, I have some conference updates for PERC uh, 20, which is July 26th through 30th. That's next month. Our, our workshop uh, was accepted by the PERC committee and it's been scheduled for Monday, July 27th. So if you are attending PERC and you're curious about our workshop, please check that out uh, at trustedci.org slash PERC20-workshop. Um, also, the Trusted CI NSF Cybersecurity Summit is September 22nd through 24th. Oh, apologies. It says Bloomington, Indiana, but this is going to be a virtual summit. Um, and we have a CFP that is open. Um, so if you go to trustedci.org slash CFP 2020, you can read our CFP. We've got many options for different types of presentations. If you would like to submit a proposal, uh, we are accepting those until Monday, June 29th. Okay, we've got another couple questions here. Um, here's one. Since the bad guys share information so freely, isn't it very easy for the good guys to follow what they're doing and block them? So how does that culture impact the overall balance? 
Um, it's actually pretty interesting because the only thing stopping the good guys from doing that for the most part is our own cultural hangups. Um, I don't have a lot of time for it now, but I spent most of my 20s just hanging out in IRC and other chat rooms and places where the bad guys congregate and kind of keeping tabs. Um, I had a couple of security projects where this was really useful to know. And honestly, I have a soft spot for some of the young ones and I tried to bring them over to the light side. What can I say? Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, but it's really easy, honestly. If you know the behavior patterns to pick up and you can mimic them, you will get let in because the only real gate for admission is them not thinking you're a fed. Um, and that doesn't mean that you end up in the middle of a really tightly run organized crime ring, but you usually don't have to be. If you're in the social group of the mid to high level freelance bad guys, um, you'll find enough about what's going on out there to have a feel for the entire threat landscape. Um, but you don't see a lot of good guys going around and joining naughty chat rooms because they're afraid that someone will find out and the FBI will show up at their door or their boss will find out and they'll get fired or something like that. Um, it, it's interesting because it's so easy to do and almost no one does it. Yeah, it seems like a, well, it seems a little time intensive too. Like you were saying, it's something that you were doing in your early 20s. Harder to do yeah. when, you, <laughs> when you're deputy director of research SOC. It is. These are not concise people. I want you to picture um, the stereotype of like chattery junior high school girls who will not shut up in class and the speed at which they generate text to the ratio of actual content in the text. And then I want you to turn it into mostly young men who have a little too much what my grandma used to call piss and vinegar. That is the textual communication style of that community. Uh, we have another question here. Is there a critical set of security measures that institutions can adopt and thus claim as performing due diligence in order to manage risk of litigation by their clients? And wouldn't this encourage threat communication? Um, when you start saying things like due diligence and risk of litigation, I refer you to some of the many bright lawyers that I work with because I am a hacker, not a lawyer. And that is not my area of expertise. Um, I will say that I do believe there is a level at which you can demonstrate good faith that should protect you if you're doing threat communication in order to improve the defense landscape. The problem is there are no high profile. And when I say high profile, my personal definition of high profile is people who are not lawyers and don't deal with the law for a living know about it. There are no high profile cases that have tested this in court. So everybody's scared. They don't want to be the first one who becomes that test case. And so they don't. Um, I want desperately to break this taboo, but I haven't figured out the secret code that makes it happen yet. If any of you are smarter than me and can figure out, please, for the sake of all of us, do so. Okay, let's, um, let's do another round for, for questions. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left. If, if you guys have questions, please uh, type them in the chat. Uh, for more information about the Trusted Web, Trusted CI webinar series, you can go to trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is July 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is the Engagement and Performance Operations Center, or EPOC, or yeah, EPOC. Uh, our speaker is Doug Southworth, uh, who's a network systems analyst at Indiana University. So Indiana's getting some pride here, back-to-back -back presentations, <laughs> even though you're working for different organizations. Okay, so last call for questions. Um, thank you so much, Susan, for presenting. I think this is a very interesting presentation and uh, hopefully the, uh, the attendees got some, some useful advice out of it. Uh, we've got one more follow-up here coming in. There is information sharing through NISAC and other organizations. Is that inferior to what, you call, what you're calling for? In for, Apologies, I think this might be a typo. 
Sorry about that. I had already um, muted when you asked that. So I will say that it's an amazing quality of information. It isn't quite the breadth of sharing or the speed of sharing that I would like to see. For example, when you share information through Ren ISAC, that's limited to sharing with other Ren ISAC members. Meaning that, for example, all of the small research projects are just completely left in the dark because they're not big enough to swing a Ren ISAC membership. So it, it's a great start. It's a great quality of information. I want to see us get as good at sharing as the bad guys are. I've heard the epic folks pronounce it epic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and thanks for a great webinar today. That's, thank you. Thank you for appreciating it and enjoying it. Um, I have a follow up here. Uh, such a broad sharing would require resources. Any comments I mean, about the resources? Honestly, the bad guys are doing it pretty ad hoc. If I was allowed to take, you know, basically a pretty big room full of students, I could get it set up for all of us worldwide and just maintain it with a rotating bunch of students and like three or so smart professionals working part time. It's not that hard. Once you get rid of the idea that your information sharing has to be secret and that everyone who's party to it has to be vetted from here to Tuesday. Um, making that cultural shift I think is going to be a really big ask for our community and I don't know how to ever make it happen. I got another question here. Um, if a defender finds a vulnerability that they don't think has been found by the quote-unquote bad guys, is there a concern that by sharing such info you are alerting the bad guys and making attacks more likely? That is definitely the concern that I hear from people, but I think that defenders really underestimate the degree, to, the degree of certainty that we should have that those things will be found eventually. And what happens when you don't share is that it remains a broadly applicable vulnerability that hurts a lot of people. Whereas if we share rapidly, we can fix rapidly before the bad guys can respond. Because again, once, once a vulnerability becomes public, um, one of the really good experiments we had was um, NTP Classic, the reference implementation for the network time protocol. Um, the developer of that project at one period in time was sharing vulnerabilities privately with a sponsor list of some kind um, months before he was releasing patches or information on the vulnerability to the public. And he insisted that this was making his sponsor list more safe but either because his distribution mechanism was compromised or because of how somebody on the recipient list was handling the information or because of his own poor information security practices. Um, once you share something to a couple dozen people, it's just not a secret. Um, every release that he did was weaponized within 12 to 24 hours and became a widely spread, easy to apply, canned exploit. And it took forever to get him to pull back that practice. I don't know if he stopped. He's told me that he stopped. Um, but it, it was terrifying because this quote unquote secret vulnerability that only the good guys know about was getting weaponized and used about, against all the people who were defenders, but not in the secret group of people who got to, who got communication. Let's do a last call for questions. And thank you so much for the people who have been asking questions so far. This is, seems to be a pretty lively discussion, which is hard to do over chat. And I really appreciate your patience with us. And uh, while we're doing that, again, Susan, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I will be posting these slides later today, along with a copy of the video. So we encourage you to share this with your colleagues if you find, if you think that they will find this interesting. Any uh, wrap up comments you would like to make, Susan? I really think that's it. I hope I've offered you some tools that will help you think about threat intelligence. And I hope from now on, whenever anybody asks you how worried I should be, you will tell them zero, zero worry. There is no spoon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
uh, well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, we've got some people saying thank you in the chat. So, so Susan, uh, thank you again. And um, we will be in touch with the uh, next presentation next month. So uh, everybody have a great day and stay safe.